a stranger. And you invited me in. I was sick. And you looked after me. I needed a teacher. And you inspired me. I was lost. And you prayed for me. I was addicted. And you helped me break free. I needed a mentor. And you were there for me. I felt alone. And you showed me true community. You helped me experience the joy of worship. You made me feel welcome and safe. You gave me the strength to keep going. You led me to Jesus. I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight to Eastside Baptist Church for our Sunday evening worship service. Everybody's going to have to look alert at me tonight. I see everybody with the glazed over eyes. <laughs> as you just saw with the screen, and as Alan had said this morning for the choir, um, when we look at the church, it takes the whole church working together, volunteering together um, to make the church work. So I just want to reiterate, I just want to say, where is God calling you to serve here at Eastside Baptist Church? If you're not already presently serving in a ministry, where is God calling you to serve? If God um, is calling you to be a part of the music ministry, please come be a part of that. If God's calling you to get involved in another area of the life of the church, pray about that, consider that, and let God use you as God does something really special and powerful here at Eastside Baptist Church. So we're going to show that video again Sunday morning, but I just wanted you to see that tonight and um, let us be thinking about and praying about um, as we start our new year, where this year does God want to use you to make an impact here at Eastside Baptist Church? Well, tonight I want to read to you in our public reading of the Word of God, from Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 1 as we get ready to worship tonight. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. Your counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we love you. We just lift up this very special time that you've given us to come together and to worship you. We pray that you would accept our worship. We pray, Lord, that as we give everything that we are and as we honor you tonight, we pray, Lord, that you would bless this time of worship. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. ask you to stand with us as we sing our first song tonight, hymn number 288. We'll sing the first and last verse. Let us stand. Tell the good news. Christ was born in the
Our choir comes down this evening. Shake somebody's hand that you did not this morning. Tell them you're glad they're at Eastside Baptist Church tonight. Serve thee. I will serve thee because I love thee. You have given life to me. I was nothing before you found. Good. 
and pieces ruin lives are why you died on Calvary your touch was what I longed for you have given life to me thank you and you may be seated our offertory hymn this evening is hymn number 391 stand up stand up for Jesus and I just made a mistake we can't sing stand up stand up for Jesus while we're sitting down so let's stand back up we'll sing the first and last verse of stand up stand up for Jesus Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor's song. To him that overcometh, a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you provided. Lord, we just pray now that you'll just... Enlighten our hearts one more, once again, Lord, because this morning we had a real good message. And, Lord, we just pray that you've given Pastor Josh the words that we need to hear again tonight. Lord, we just thank you for all the people that are here and the ones that aren't. We just pray that you'll just touch their hearts in some way. Lord, now that we take this tithes and offerings and use it for your glory, for we ask these things, Christ's sake. Amen. <laughs> I'd like to ask you to take your Bibles tonight and turn with me to the book of Acts. I'm going to begin there, chapter 2, and we want to look at verse 4. Tonight is really just a continuation of last week's message. We looked at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And tonight we are looking at the filling of the Holy Spirit in our series on the Holy Spirit. So let's look at uh, verse 4 of Acts chapter 2. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now will you turn to Ephesians chapter 5 and look at verse 18.
And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now look at verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, as we open your word tonight and as we study on this doctrine of the Holy Spirit and specifically the subject of being filled by your Spirit, pray, Lord, that you would speak through the text tonight. I pray that you would use your Spirit to preach this message and teach this message to the people tonight. I pray, Father, that you would use your Spirit and, Lord, hold back the preacher's tongue. And Lord, would they hear what the Spirit testifies through your Word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last week, we looked at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We noted that the baptism and the filling of the Spirit are two totally different things. It's kind of like the, the rapture and the second coming. You have a lot of folks that will just kind of put that into one event. And we'll see that as one event, not two separate events. People will also take the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit, and they will see that as one thing, not a baptism and not a filling. So we noted that there are two different things. And in looking at um, Ephesians 5 tonight, you will note that it is a command to be filled with the Spirit by the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, where the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a command. Only water baptism is the command in dealing with baptism, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a command. It's something that happens when you get saved. And if you noted in Acts 2, they were sitting there in the room and the baptism of the Holy Spirit came. They weren't commanded to do anything. They were there, and it came. So it's not a command, while the filling is a command. Now, Ephesians 5.18, it's a very, very important verse. Before really diving in and studying this verse for this series, I wasn't even aware of just how critical and how important this verse is. Now, whenever we start talking about what if you deleted this verse? What if you took this verse out? What if you removed this verse from this book? What would that do? And I believe we would all agree that it would have great effects on the Word of God. But I read one scholar that said that if you were to take the 18th verse out of Ephesians 5, if you were to delete it and remove it, it would ruin the entire book of Ephesians. Think about it for a moment of what you're dealing with when you come to the book of Ephesians. You are dealing with unity in the Spirit. You are dealing with walking in the Spirit. You are dealing with spiritual gifts. You are dealing with the husband's relationship to the wife where he loves the wife like Christ loved the church. You are dealing with the wife's relationship to the husband where she submits to her husband. You are dealing with the children who are to obey their parents. You are dealing with the parents, particularly fathers there, who are not to provoke their children to anger or to wrath. You are dealing with the relationship between servants and between masters. 
You are dealing with so many issues that where if you took verse 18 out and you're not functioning in the Spirit, it turns it into nothing short of legalism. Where it's just a bunch of laws, it's just a bunch of precepts, it's just a bunch of instructions, and by the way, there are instructions that you can't fulfill outside of the Spirit of God. So in looking at all of that, verse 18 is incredibly important, not just for what we're talking about tonight, but for the whole framework of the epistle written to the Ephesians written to the church at Ephesus. So let's dive into this, in this doctrine, into this subject a little bit tonight. First, I want to talk to you about a word of warning. Go back and look at uh, Ephesians 5 and verse 18 again tonight. And I just want to look at the, just the first part, the warning that Paul lays out as he brings this command of being filled with the Spirit. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation or debauchery. It's important to really understand the context of what he is saying in reference to being drunk with wine. He is not referring to social drinking. He is not referring to a situation where they would be sitting around a table, they would be out and about, it would be a social event, and they would be drinking. Now, as Christians, we know that that is not a good thing. I would would recommend Christians to not be involved in social drinking. Your pastor takes an abstinence stance when it comes to alcohol, believing that uh, Christians should not partake in drinking. But that is not what Paul is getting at. Paul is getting at a method that the pagans would use where they would get drunk. It would induce a state where they would commune with false deities. And when they got drunk, to say they got drunk is putting it mildly. They got so drunk, they would drink to the point of being sick. They would vomit, and then they would drink again. They really drank. And it was all to bring about a communion. It was all to bring about a presence. It was all to be able to have this relationship with these deities false deities that they believed in and that they were calling upon and that they wanted to commune with. So so Paul brings a contrast here. He is saying, don't be full of wine. Be full of the Spirit. Don't try to seek false deities through the drinking and through the drunkenness, but instead... Seek the one and the true and the only God. Be be full of the Spirit. This is really not an unusual contrast because you can see this contrast played out in Scripture over and over again. For example, take your Bibles tonight and turn to Luke chapter 1 and look at verse 15. Luke chapter 1, and look at verse 15. And I'm just going to paraphrase for you what's going on. You have the text before you. You have John the Baptist, who was born, who was going to be born. He is going to grow to do great things in the kingdom of God. And the text says, he will not, he will not have the influence. He will not partake in drinking liquor, drinking in wine, drinking in any kind of alcohol. But if you notice, in verse 15, it actually talks about 
in his mother's womb. So if you go a little bit deeper here, you note that even the mother will not be partaking in wine, will not be partaking in liquor, will not be partaking in alcoholic beverage while she is carrying this baby to where while drinking while she's pregnant, the alcohol would affect the brain and would affect the baby. He would have absolutely no ties, no influence. Alcohol would not have an impact on his life. He would be born and he would abstain from, stay away from alcohol. Now, we can debate social drinking and people can debate whether people should drink or not and they can call it social issues, but every time you look at it, it's a theological issue. It's a theological issue. And you see, when preachers get together and they debate these things, when people get together and they talk about drinking, I wonder what they do with Luke 115. I wonder what preachers do with that with that text, when they want to try to bring about even the social drinking aspect, that you look at the example of John the Baptist and how he stayed away from, abstained from the influence of alcohol. Again, the concept that's in the text is not that he would be filled with that or influenced by that, but he would be filled with the Spirit, impacted by the Spirit, influenced by the Holy Spirit of God. But that's not the only contrast. You go back to Acts 2, and again, you see the contrast. You see Peter, who is full of the Spirit, he's been baptized in the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, and he stands to preach. And he's been given through the filling of these tongues where he can preach in his own language, but everybody that's hearing this will hear it in their own language. And there comes a time, I believe verse 13, where somebody cries out, somebody says, he's drunk. He's been drinking that new wine. Peter says, I am not drunk. I have not been drinking. I'm full of the Spirit. Again, not full of liquor, not full of wine, not full of alcohol, but full of the Holy Spirit, full of the Spirit of God. So Paul gives the warning, if you shoot back to Ephesians 5.18, Paul is giving the warning of not being full of wine, not being drunk with wine, not being influenced by that, but instead being filled with the Spirit, being full of the Holy Spirit of God. Which would bring us to the question, what does it mean then to be full or to be filled with the Spirit of God? After all, if you look within the New Testament, you have many different references in many different situations where you read such and such, this person, that person, this apostle, that apostle, this man of God, that man of God was full of or filled with the Spirit of God. Let me give you a few references tonight. Number one, if you go to Acts 6, where you have the instituting, the beginning with the deacon ministry, the apostles could not handle all of the work of the ministry and the preparing and the praying, so they needed seven men to be selected. Seven men that would be the deacon body. And the church was told, the people were told to select these men. The apostles did not select them. The apostles did not say, 
Here are the seven men. They'll be your deacons from now on. It was congregational rule and congregational authority as he told them to seek the men. And one of the requirements he gave was seven men full of the Spirit. Full of the Spirit. When it comes time and the church is asked to nominate deacons, and they are to write down a name to be considered as deacon. Don't look around. Don't try to find somebody. Think of who is full of the Spirit. Who is full of wisdom? Who is one that God has put on your heart that you would nominate, that you would recommend to be a deacon? The text says, choose men that are full of wisdom and full of the Spirit. That minister to us tonight. Number two, Stephen, in the, in, coming to the end of his life, as he lifted up his eyes, gave his spirit up. The text says he was full of the spirit, full of the spirit of God, was Stephen, who gave the defense for the faith. In Acts 13, 9, the Bible says Paul is full of the Spirit. In Acts chapter 4, in verse 8, it says, Peter is filled with the Spirit. Many other texts talk about God's servants being full or being filled with the Spirit. So again, the question comes. The question is posed. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? What does it mean to be full of the Spirit of God? Well, let me give you a definition tonight. Number one. To be filled with the Spirit and to be full of the Spirit of God, it is the fuel to the believer. It is the fuel to the servant of God. It is the fuel in doing ministry for God. Both tonight and especially this morning, we heard Charlton over here on the piano and did a beautiful job as he always does talented man play that piano but you know if I got over here and I tried to play that piano I don't think it would sound anything like Charles the piano is not the issue is it the piano is not the problem the problem is me when you think about ministry and when you think about doing ministry, as beautiful as that piano is, it doesn't play on its own. It doesn't play by itself. It takes, it takes something to make that piano go. I've heard sermons that were well-researched, had great content, very eloquent, was something lacking. The lacking was the Spirit of God. You can tell when a service or a message, Spirit-driven and Spirit-led and Spirit-filled, and God is just behind it, and God is just in it. When we look at this fuel, when we look at being filled with the Spirit. We see one before God. We see the believer before God. We see that he has communed with God. We see that um, his thoughts are God's thoughts. Words are God's words. Actions are God's actions. That he is drinking from the fountain so richly and so deeply that when you 
hear him or you hear um, her in terms of just servants of God, you can feel and you can sense God's truth and how they are being led and how they're being uh, motivated, how they're being controlled by the spirit of God. That God's servant has a real presence, a real anointing, a moment-by-moment leading that is on their life. There is a power on their life as they minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the church isn't led of the Spirit, when the church isn't filled with the Spirit, when the church isn't driven by the Spirit, it won't accomplish much at all. When the soul winner goes out there and as honest as he or she is, they want to win people to Christ. But they haven't gone in the Spirit. They're not filled with the Spirit. And they go out and witness, and they're doing it in their power. They're doing it in their strength doing it in the flesh, and people don't come to Christ. The servant of God, the preacher of God, the pastor of God, the missionary of God, the Sunday school teacher, whoever it is, when they're operating, they're not filled with the Spirit. There's not an anointing that rests upon them. They're not going to accomplish very much for God because they're doing it in their own power. It's not a step-by-step. It's not a moment-by-moment. It's not an anointing that rests there. It's not that they are being led and driven in this powerful sense by the Holy Spirit of God. Paul, again, he commands He doesn't give room for any kind of suggestion. He doesn't give room for any kind of afterthought. He is commanding that we as the believers of Jesus Christ be filled with the Spirit. It's a a real forceful command that Paul is giving in the text. Now if you look at Jesus and his commanding, when he commanded that the storm would cease, that the winds would cease, it happened. It was a forceful command. When he commanded that the evil spirit come out of the boy and go into the pigs, it happened. It was a forceful command. It is a command upon the church of Jesus Christ that we would be filled with, with the Spirit of God. So let's come to the second question. That's what it is. To put it in simple terms, it is a great anointing of God. Where the Spirit fills you, and when you go to do ministry, it is God's Spirit doing ministry through you and in you. So how do you How can you be filled with the Spirit? Number one, we must be in a right and proper relationship with God. It's not to say that we won't sin because we're going to sin. But it would suggest and it would say that we are sensitive to sin. In that right relationship with God... When we sin and the Holy Spirit convicts us of that sin and that sin becomes obvious to us, we are drawn in that right, proper relationship to repent of that sin. And again, repentance is not saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is turning from that sin. Repentance is moving away from that sin. Repentance is doing something different. It's not continuing in that sin and just saying, I'm sorry. 
So being in a right relationship with God, where you are sensitive towards sin and you're repenting of the sin that is in your life, that is in my life. Number two, what does our prayer life look like? I mean, are we, are we really going to be filled with the Spirit? Are we really going to be full of the Spirit? These men we read about in God's Word that were filled and full of the Spirit, they were consistent, constant prayer warriors. You know, when you read in the Old Testament about Daniel and about how he was threatened not to pray to God, window open. I don't believe he was hanging out of the window, throwing it in the face of the adversaries. I think he was doing what he normally did. I think he was doing what he always did. I think he was praying to his God, the one and true and only God. What does our prayer life look like? Because if we really want to be filled and full of the Spirit, our prayer life has to reflect that. We have to seek God. We have to be warriors of Number three, if we're really interested in being filled, if we're really interested in the anointing of God, if we're really interested in being full of the Spirit, we must pour this word into our lives. How are we supposed to be filled? And how are we supposed to be full? And how are we supposed to accomplish spiritual things? As the church of Jesus Christ, with our Bibles closed, with our Bibles down, with our Bibles never read, with our Bibles never sought, where God's word is never coming in and being poured into our life. Number four, what's your worship look like? I do not mean, are you here Sunday morning, are you here Sunday night, are you here Wednesday night? about what is your worship like? Not a worship service, but your worship. Worship is God's people giving everything we are to Him. It is a, it is a delight within our spirit to come and to hear biblical truth, to come and to sing biblical truth, to be around other believers, to truly Worship God. And by the way, the greatest worship you'll ever give to God is obedience to Him. Are we giving all that we are to God? And as far as the worship service would go, the worship service shouldn't start at 11 o'clock a.m. on a Sunday morning. The, 11, uh, the worship service for us should start when we get out of bed. We should begin to pray. We should begin to seek God. We should begin to read the word. We should begin to seek God's face for what he wants to say to us every day of our lives. And when these four things are key and are, sen- not that we do them perfectly, but are key and are sensitive in our life, what happens is The anointing of God rests upon that person. Her name was Annie. She was bedridden. And a preacher was doing a revival. And the pastor went to her house. And he went right in the door. Didn't knock. Just walked right in. The visiting pastor, who was a son of a pastor said, you don't ever do that. (laughs) You don't ever just walk in somebody's house. Well, then he did something even more daring. He walked into her bedroom. He said, you dead sure don't do that. You don't walk into a lady's bedroom. There she was on that bed. And what she would do is she had a book and she had a calendar. And from her bed, she had names and she was praying all day long for those names in that book and on the calendar for that day. The pastor was telling the revival preacher how many people they had baptized. And he was saying, 
that they were names she had been praying from her bed who had gotten saved. This lady, who could do nothing else but lay there, was full of the Spirit of God. She had the anointing of God on her life. God mightily used her from her bed to lead people to Christ. Sometimes we can be a little impatient. and We can think, well, I'm checking off the list, I'm doing the things. Why? I don't feel like I'm really have the anointing. I don't feel like I'm really filled with the Spirit. I don't feel like God's really doing something with me. Are we really willing to wait and to keep doing that until the fire falls, until the fire really hits? Until the anointing of God rests upon us. Which would lead me to one last question tonight in this subject. How many fillings are there? How many times does somebody fill with the Spirit? I mean, one would think it just happens once, right? You're filled with the Spirit and that's it, once. But you might be interested to learn that it actually is more than that. So in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, you have that first baptism and filling. In, in verse 2 is the baptism, in verse 4 is the filling. But if you went to Acts chapter 4 and verse 8, you would note another filling. You would note that there is another being filled Filled with the Spirit of God. As I believe Peter there is being filled with the Spirit of God, but he was already filled earlier on. And if you go to Acts 4.31, matter of fact, let's go there, and you would see yet another filling of the Spirit of God. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Stop there. So you see it's a continual, you see it's a constant, where the anointing of God rests upon you, fills you. You know, I have my notes and I'm sitting there Sunday morning and I'm going through my notes and I'm ready to come and preach and I'm thinking, am I going to say everything that I've planned to say? Am I going to get it right? Is it going to be powerful? Memorable? Is God going to use it? And sometimes Satan says to me, you're about to bomb. <laughs> this is going to be terrible. And as soon as I get up here, God takes over. God does his work. God speaks. God does what he does. I believe that when we are seeking him, when we're in that right relationship with him, his anointing rests on us. And when we go to do what he's called us to do, and fulfill his will, I believe his anointing, the filling of the Spirit is a continual filling. As a matter of fact, let me take you back for just a moment tonight because I think this is very, very important. Now, in Ephesians 5, in the English, it does say, be filled with the Spirit. But in the, in the Greek New Testament, he, here's the way it is if you translate it verbatim. Be being kept filled. Be being kept filled. That communicates to us it is a constant. It is a continual filling. It is not just once you're filled. It is not just you get filled one time. But as you minister for Jesus Christ, 
God continues, the Spirit continues to fill you, to anoint you for the work that He's prepared you to do. And that's the impact of ministry. That's the difference between a dead church and an alive church. That's the difference between a church that is going somewhere and a church that's staying right where it is. That's a difference between a ministry and just something that's just a going through the motion. Let us pray tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I am so humbled by your, by your word, by your presence, by what you wish to accomplish through the people, the sweet people of this church. I am so moved by reading your word, experiencing your word. I'm so moved by worship that happens in this place. And tonight, Lord, I just, I just wonder tonight, with this time of invitation, this time of singing, this time of inviting people to respond to what's been said tonight, to what the Scripture teaches, I just wonder who will step out of the crowd. I wonder who will say those four, those five things. I want to... I want to focus on those. I want to see those as really sensitive in my life. I want to be filled with the Spirit. I want to take this command seriously tonight. I want to see God move in my life, spiritually fill me and use me. I want to see that happen in my life. I wonder who will step out and say that tonight as we invite a response tonight. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.